Could you pass the beer over to me? Yeah. All right. All right, I think it sounds all right. More beer? Yeah, I think. Uh, <coughs> <laughs> well, I don't know. Um, cool, I think we can start. It's now. <laughs> Hello. Hello, everyone. <laughs> Thank you for um, coming here. Thank you for tuning in. Uh, this is a new episode of Just Do It, frankly supported by Sandy in London, by Francesca and Liam, who are hosting us here, and uh, with our guest Tamuna Chaiswini, who is um, a legal advisor for the Deutsche Bank here in London. And she wants to talk about what do we mean by financial uh, by financial business? What does it mean to be an investment banker? What does it have to do with us? And I guess, at least uh, for my part, I don't know so many things. <coughs> like I was talking with my terminal before and about what we could talk about, and we quickly figured out that we should talk about <coughs> jargon, the terminology from the beginning, because you can talk about efforts and pairs or something like this. And um, there's always these words that fly around that become so normal for us to use. But actually, um, what 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 does it mean to talk talk about this like subprime market, for example? Like I know now a little bit because I talk with Tamuna about many people, <laughs> but I don't know supreme or supreme or who's um, Ellie Greenspan. What has he to do with that? So many good questions. <laughs> <laughs> um, yeah, and eventually we come also to the point: um, Are banks evil? Do we, do we like them? Do we don't like them? Can we live without a bank? I don't think so. No. But maybe you talk about. It. All right. Um, so uh, I, I thought about what would be a good starting point, and um, probably sort of the popular perception of banks and bankers. And you touched on this already. Is a good starting point, and um, uh, banking is probably the most hated profession right now, <laughs> I would say. And um, um, as, as I was doing a bit of reading in preparation for this talk, I realised I came across lots of um, examples where sort of banker bashing uh, actually is not new at all, and it 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 um, it has um, it has quite a bit of history. Um, um, and you know we are all familiar with the, the you know the Shylock character. And we all you know sort of the uh, caricatures of um, uh, bankers, you know, such as the Rothschild family and the sort of anti-Semitic side to that. Um, and then I came across some um, interesting, uh, some other interesting kind of pronouncements on on, on bankers, and one of them was. Uh, this story that was reported about Schopenhauer, who uh, went into a gallery that was um, exhibiting uh, um, uh, portraits of the, the Fugler family, which is the, the German um, mercantile dynasty in the 15th, 16th centuries, kind of comparable to the Medici family. And he's reported to, to have looked at the, the, the portraits quite in, in intently and uttered the following words, when I look at your faces, I have to admit that God is not with you. <laughs> um, which, which, which is interesting. And um, the other sort of literary reference that I found quite interesting and actually links to uh, some characteristics of the banking system that I want to pick up on is um, there's this wonderful, wonderful, nonsensical poem by Lewis Carroll and it's called The Mad Gardener's Song. And there's one stanza in it which is about bankers. And he says, um, it, it goes like this. He thought he saw a banker's clerk descending from the bus. He looks again um, and found it was a hippopotamus. If this should stay uh, to dine, there won't be much for us. Um, so 
the, the, the themes that I want to sort of imagery I wanted to sort of pick up on this kind of the hippopotamus and the, the greed aspect of it, right? Yeah. And the hippopotamus and the, the, the probably the current jargon that everyone has heard about banks is too big to fail, right? You know, too big to fail. And why is that? How, how did we get to the point where, you know, the banks have got so enormous that they can bring down the, the whole whole economy, which they did in, in the 2008 crisis. Um, and again, this perception of you know, the, the, the greed. Um, and I suppose um, trying to approach this question, I wanted to uh, look at two things. Um, <clears throat> and one was um, what, again, in um, sort of uh, the finance jargon is called liquidity. Um, uh, and the other thing, is what I would describe as 100 degrees of separation. And let me just let me just explain myself what I mean. So in terms of liquidity, um, let's think about it this way. So what you said, what, what, what do banks do? What's, what's their purpose? And I think the most kind of immediate uh, and comprehensible kind of um, uh, explanation of the role of the banks and, and the, 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 their, uh, the point in having banks is obviously to um, stimulate the economy, to uh, provide the financing, to provide what we call liquidity. And I wanted to illustrate this, uh, I mean, I think if we, if we go back a little bit, say, to the sort of industrial revolution and how, uh, you know, the massive um, explosion in the sort of uh, uh, the development of industry um, wouldn't have happened without the finance and without the banks having been there to finance the railroads and, you know, electricity stations or automobile industry or you, you name it, um, people kind of have a very good understanding of that, something that's very tangible, right? So it's it's it's, it's kind of you, you banks can get together and syndicate, you finance the project, you have, you know, this infrastructure projects or public utilities which which um, have a place in the sort of social economic model and development, and people can benefit from it, and it creates employment, etc., etc. That, that is relatable and understandable, right? And you, you can't possibly do that without banks being there. So liquidity is 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 um, uh, sort of um, very much at the heart of what banks do. And, and again, perhaps I'm laboring this point, but you know, take an example of a sort of a factory owner who, um, for example, has um, additional orders and, and they want to purchase machinery and tools so they can deliver those orders and you know they, they turn to a bank for financing and sort of that, that, that leads to the expansion of the business and probably employment of, of people in the factory etc etc or the other example would be they wanted to uh, divest sort of part of their business because they, they wanted to invest in something else or they wanted you know, they couldn't do that by sort of selling part of their factory. Um, but what they could do, they could sell shares in that part of the factory. So that's how sort of financial innovation comes in. And the things um, such as buildings and machinery, which are illiquid, can be turned into something more agile and more liquid, such as you, you have you have loans uh, in, in terms of the financing instruments or you have you have shares. So um, it, that's that's I suppose one 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 aspect that is quite important. But I would describe that as a double edged um, sword, liquidity, because what's happened um, since the transition from sort of the industrial capitalism to modern day cap capitalism, um, sort of in the post or current neoliberal uh, model is basically this liquidity has back backfired in the sense that um, because 
um, because because financial assets are so liquid and so short term, because you can buy and sell them so quickly, and the, um, you know the, the, it, it is about short termism. It's about identifying um, the profit opportunities. You know, if you, if you sold your shares now, would you make a quick buck? You know, that's what it becomes about. It becomes about short term realization of the profit rather than long-term investment in sort of in industrial capital and sort of physical capital and human uh, skills such as employment and organizational and economic development. Are you talking about still about the banks? Yeah. Yes. Yeah. 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 yeah, so so I'm, I'm talking about the um, Two faces to investment banking because investment banking would do corporate lending. They would still do corporate lending, so they would still or government or sovereign lending. So they would still lend, uh, provide financing, um, or, or facilitate the raising of financing by governments. You know, across the world, they would still lend to businesses, big businesses, or or, or even small businesses. It you know, depends what what part of investment bank it is. And, and and that's a good thing. I think that's what I'm trying to say because that's mm. that's kind of indispensable to the economy and indispensable to um, the way the society functions. But then there is the darker side or the other side of investment banking, which is which is detached from um, which is detached from sort of industrial output or sort of production of sort of tangible. Um, uh, tangible worth, if I can put it that way, and that that part of investment banking is more about, you know, it's referred to as securities trading or, or, or trading full stop, and it is about it is about you know uh, short term profiteering. It, it is about speculation, and you know it, it, it then becomes what I would then describe as this kind of hundred degrees of separation where. You know, you, you initially had a sort of a physical, tangible asset, uh, such as let's talk about houses. You know, such as you have a you have a house, you have a mortgage on it. Everybody understands what a mortgage is. That's a simple financial product. It's linked to a, a tangible asset. And then you, in, in, in now I'm contrasting it with the sort of the industrial capitalism era. We, we move on to the sort of late 20th century and early um, 21st where you, you have a very sophisticated financial instruments developed and in that in relation to the, the house that, that I just mentioned what you have is <coughs> what you have is um, banks um, taking the, 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 the mortgages um, Packaging them together, what's what's called securitization, um, selling them, getting getting them off their balance sheet, selling them to um, a newly incorporated uh, vehicle, investment vehicle, which then issues um, uh, bonds uh, off the back of the transfer loans uh, and distributes the the ownership interest, so to speak. Uh, to to the to the investors and the investors, you know, it's a vast pool of investors. So that that is basically securitization. And what happens is um, the the so the, the the bank has sold the assets. They obviously received the financing for it, and they can um, they can use that for for their further activities. Um, you have this sort of securitized um, instruments now. This this uh, um, pieces of um, paper which investors own in the in the market, and then the finance world didn't stop at that. Um, they didn't stop at what's called mortgage backed uh, securities or, or bonds. Um, then they went to develop even more complicated uh, financial products where. Um, they resecuritized even existing um, securitized bonds, and they're referred to as. I don't know if you have heard of um, um, CDOs, which are collateralized debt obligations, and it's like several tranches. Well, so let's just link this to the subprime crisis and uh, what happened there. So, um, you know, in um, 
in um, actually it was in the US that it that was very first developed. Um, a lot of um, loans were given out to um, uh, what's called subprime borrowers um, because the, you know these were borrowers who didn't have the necessary credit rating and therefore they were not prime borrowers they were subprime and the attraction of, of lending to in sort of risky borrowers is uh, you can charge a high rate of interest so uh, because it's you know, you have to pay more to hmm. to to to, 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 um, to be trusted, so to speak. Right? But that doesn't make any sense from the beginning because people don't have the money to even yeah. pay the high interest rates. So no. Yeah, um, and this is in the context of also the sort of the the, the political uh, and ideological sort of context of uh, U.S. government, not just U.S. government, encouraging a home ownership and sort of setting up schemes where. Um, more and more people can own their homes, um, but essentially, so, so you, you, you're talking about the situation where um, it got so bad that there were so-called ninja loans, uh, which which are no income, what is it? no income, no jobs, no assets. Uh, so you're talking, yeah, that's what ninja stands for. Um, wow. Okay, loans. What's that? Don't get liable. <laughs> That's where you don't yeah. look at this. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So it means <laughs> anybody, you don't, you just come as you are and you leave the alone. Well, it doesn't matter anymore. Yeah, and it's, 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 and I think what happened was the reason why banks, you know, were happy to um, make these loans is because they knew they could sell them. They could pass on the risk to the, to the market, right? Because they didn't have to keep this uh, on, on their books. And they had developed, you know, these complicated mathematical models which said that if you take a large, you know, pool of loans and you mix a bit of, um, a, a, a bit of junk with a, with a bit of good, good credit stuff, so you, you can, you know, in, in a complicated way you can create this layer cake where you know it's, it's it will all come out well in the end that's what i meant by tranching so you had you know different uh, risk appetites in relation to to the underlying so and, and who buys these risks of the bank um so the, the bank the bank would basically through the securitization yeah. it would make a mechanism it would be uh sold to to the investors i mean it, yeah it could be all kind it could be, yeah, yeah. I mean, it could be funds, it could be <clears throat> other financial institutions, and the attraction for investors is, you know, of, um, the rate of return on the on the riskier um, assets would be higher, you know, and um, you know, this uh, somehow, you know, because there were <clears throat> there was a lot of collusion from rating agencies, and because this is through this funky mechanism of uh, sort of um, layering good and bad assets together, the, the credit rating agencies actually uh, gave these bonds higher rates, so sort of AAA, which, which is pretty high. Um, the investors bought into the. Uh, they were story. basically cheated by the yeah. mixing, so, which is like pseudo legal because it looks fine. Yeah, so they, I think the perception in the market was. You know very much you know, there, there is this kind of a new amazing uh, product that's, that's been developed and look the rating agencies have looked at this they've examined it and they, they agree with it you know the, 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 there's a triple a rating and you know there's zero chance of um, um, or very little chance of default and uh, you know it, 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 it sort of got into this asset bubble situation where um, there's a lot of euphoria in the market, um, and um, it got really bad because I mean, there was about thousand degrees of separation. Because not only did we have this um, <clears throat> sort of securitized instruments um, with sort of multiple tranching and then uh, securitization on securitization, but then you add the sort of so-called derivative instruments into the mixture, 
um, so the credit default swaps were um, invented to give protection uh, in case there was a default on the on this CDOs, on the security-based um, instruments. And um, to give an example, um, E and I enter into a credit default swap, right? So um, I I could actually have and so have insurable so-called insurable interest that could own, for example, I have lent I don't know the Republic of Turkey, you know, 100 million US dollars, and I'm worried that the Republic of Turkey might default. Uh, and uh, you're selling me credit protection, so you're saying, you know, if the Republic of Turkey goes bust, um, I, will, I will pay you whatever you don't get under your 100 million loan. So um, that's, that's fine, and I'll pay you a fee for that. And I uh, mean, as a bank who has lent 100 million to the Republic of Turkey, I, I have comfort that I've mitigated and hedged my risk. Yeah. But then, what happens? Off the back of that, all these people in the room, they don't have to have an, an exposure, or they need not have made a loan to Turkey uh, to enter into a CDS, another derivative instrument, where they basically bet on whether Turkey goes bust or not. Ah, Does yeah. that make sense? I know we talked about that. It's yeah. like extra perverted, no? Like some people from the outside look at this business we have done, yeah. and then they start to bet on either Turkey goes past or yeah. not. And it's, that's it's, it's <laughs> a real hedge fund in this. Like that might yeah. be, that's what time you have to run, but like I feel like that would be like a really good area to speak about the role of hedge funds and why, because you're like a legal background, the way that CEOs, CDSs, and all this sort of stuff relate to the insurance market and how regulation on the insurance market. It's distinct from regulation of the securities market, even though essentially CDS yeah. is, a, is essentially an insurance yeah. product. Yeah. But anyway, so if you could speak about those two things, it might be might illuminate for them. Anyway, thank you for the <laughs> 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 yeah, but... uh, <laughs> <laughs> So did I. <laughs> Basically, there was an abysmal failure of regulation uh, of, of derivatives. I mean, things have changed now, but you know, it's, it was an unregulated market, um, um, and you know, unlike unlike the insurance industry, where you enter into a sort of classic insurance contract and they would be highly regulated, regulators essentially allowed the market to get overheated and to, to get out of hand. So, so, so to go back to my original house analogy, so you basically have this this house, the original starting point, and you haven't. What you have done is you haven't widened the base, uh, your starting point, your underlying structure, but you have built this enormous tower um, of you know other financial claims and financial instruments on, relating to that house, on, but there's no ownership interest on the house or. Do you know what I mean? So yeah, yeah. you have basically then you know, it built out this system where, where basically you have multiple floors in this structure and some of them pretty, pretty, pretty dangerous and, uh, and pretty unstable. And then what happens is when when the other bubble bursts, the whole um, structure is tumbling down. Um, yeah. And it, it, that, that's why it was so, you know, catastrophic and so sort of um, it, the, the long term effects of it spills over into 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 the real economy uh, because the value of those derivatives and those um, uh, financial assets, which I've just described, I mean, it was something like. Ridiculous! I'm like, I was reading, so the value was sixty-two trillion dollars just before the, the subprime. This is just before the bubble burst. The value of all the, the financial um, uh, uh, derivatives at the sixty-two trillion dollars when the GDP of all world countries was sixty sixty billion uh, US dollars. I mean, it, it's that crazy. <laughs> well, it, was all, it was never really based on any 
any variable that you could relate to. No, it's just a Absolutely. theoretical equation yeah. Yeah. that yeah. comes up with the state. Yeah. The other way of saying it is to, to look at GDP ratio between GDP and the, the, the value of the, of the derivative. So I, I think it was like in the US, I was reading around that time, it was um, the value of the derivative was like 900% uh, of, the, of the GDP or something. It was like, so you're absolutely right, nothing to do with the actual economic output or in production. It's, it's, it's kind of abstract. Also, I must feel that you as a house owner who originally won just a mortgage, uh, that is like so detached from you. So it has nothing, absolutely nothing to do with me. And in the end, everything goes up the colors for many people that can handle the offer. But I guess that's the thing is that they, these people who bought houses, they kind of, I mean, they were made to believe that it's fine to, you know, get a mortgage. But it's well, also, they didn't have a job and they didn't have any, anything yeah, really, and then they got a house and they were like told by the by the banker that it's fine and then you know they shouldn't worry and then they you know they, but they, it raises an interesting question of responsibility as well. Right? Yeah. yeah, yeah, exactly. Is you know it's um, when something sounds like too good to be true, it's probably too good to be true. <laughs> That's also, because what I'm thinking while you're talking is that the whole thing is built on a series of abstractions. Yes. But that's money. Like money, yeah. that's what money is, right? There's no longer, a, you know, the, the, when, in the early days when the footballers were kind of like setting up, it's kind of like, I've got this lump of gold and I'll give it to you and you'll give me this piece of paper yeah. that says that you've, you're looking after this piece of gold for me. So there's a direct relationship, but that's long since become more intricate and and, uh, and kind of circuitous and disconnected and recently like the, the value of the dollar has been now severed by Trump and the gold index right there were these moves in that direction so like money for a long time has been a complete abstraction and so then in a situation where you're as an uneducated person going to the person who's dealing with this abstraction and they're giving you reassurances then I don't know. Um, it, that idea of responsibility is <laughs> complicated somewhat by the fact that what's being dealt with is such a, a pure and complex abstraction anyway. Yeah, right. but think about the amount of debt, like the consumer debt, uh, credit cards, mortgages. Mm -hmm. I mean, this debt bubble is very much part of the. The consumers, why do people take on this debt willingly? Okay, you know, there's, there might be sold stories about it, but you know, there, there has, certainly has to be some sort of collective response. Yeah, and also like if you if you get a mortgage that you basically can't afford because you don't have a stable income, like you're also very aware that you're getting a, a, you're getting a loan that you're probably not able to pay off your whole life. Right, that that plays into that because how would you be able to? So I think you that's if you make that calculation, you should also be aware of what kind of risk you're entering. But I could always think, okay, I have no money, I want a house, I get this offer, which is yeah, this is like faulty, but I have the house as long as possible, and after that, I'm there where I started. So at least have for like whatever time the house. Yeah. And if you, like my hands are tied, and this is the only way. That this seems in any way possible. If you have nothing to lose, yeah, then but it's also, why do you have to own a house in the first place? Could like, isn't renting yeah. also fun? I don't know, yeah, of course. Right. I don't but know, like, you know, like, I'm just saying, I think it's a luxury, also, it's a luxury problem. No, but it's already a bit like weird that you have to rent a house from another person. Yeah. I mean, I think if there are, if you speak about it, it's so weird to, to buy a house. Uh, I mean, there is, it's more weird than the person who own more houses and you have to rent No, completely, them. but if, I mean, if you can afford it, buy a house, great. If you can't, maybe you don't have to own a house. And then right? what I mean is, like, on a more on a psychological side, <laughs> that everybody is delusional on purpose. And like every yeah. stage, there's so many stages involved that yeah. nobody sees the beginning and the end. So yeah. I'm just a little cock in the whole operation here. Yeah. So I also never have to carry the responsibility. Which is somehow the same as in the Nazi regime, what everybody said. I was here just pressing the button, but it does, nobody told me. Yeah. Um, I think you can very much.
compare this like delusional effect of big systems that are made complicated mm. and like mm. blurry yeah. on purpose. And who is in the end responsible? No one, but it falls back on someone. Like, no one is responsible. Yes? I mean, that's what you were who were who trying to get to the responsibility. And I guess then the question is the bank responsible? Mm-hmm. Who is the bank? Mind? And yeah, I mean. Well, it's a, it's a very. So I definitely think that it's, it's not just the banks. Mm. Um, I definitely think. Um, we all have a role to play in this. Regulators have a role to play in this. I'm sorry, politicians. Poly- mm. There's a failure of governance. I mean, there's a point of view out there that says the you know financial crisis actually wasn't a market crisis. It was a crisis of uh, of, of state. Um, you know, it was a state failure. It was a crisis of public governance, right? You know, it's uh, and. I, I don't think you can you can point a finger to to one particular um, part of the system, and it just brings up very interesting questions about you know uh, my initial sort of thoughts on this were that you know bankers are actually they operate within within the system in which they they find themselves. And I believe, believe that actually, and then the, the money relationship you described in the, the financial system, they, they actually are probably slaves uh, of that system. You know, they're very well paid slaves, but slaves nonetheless, they operate within that. So, but is it just the fault of the system? Are, are we as humans, citizens, voters, whatever, we create the system in which we are, right? So, I don't well, we're all in it, and we're all in it to the same degree. And so, like, it's like you can't, like, if you're talking about responsibility, it's like there's a there's something about it in the, within the idea of responsibility that something how there's something to point at, mm-hmm. and I don't know if there's anything to point at because it's it, it's everywhere, and everybody's responsible yeah. to and within it. So then, how do you? That's that's what makes it so complex because it's such a vast. Um, mechanism like the banks are only a small part of, um, you know, politics, education. Like, yeah. like, like we're just basically talking about the uh, the the entire um, capitalist model, yeah. which is yeah. which encompasses our whole world, right? yeah. what our, our whole life. Is. And that's why I think it is um, sort of short-sighted. Um, when fingers are pointed at the bankers and sort of all anger and blame. Is directed to, 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 to them uh, as a way of absorbing, every, you know, them, them, ourselves probably, or you know, anger and blame just feels satisfying, but it takes away from that um, more nuanced understanding of, of complexity and that you know we are. It's not them and us actually. We are all in this, and there are lots of aspects, and we operate in this capitalist model, and there are so many aspects to it then you can't isolate one from the other. So um But is the problem with this bank in particular is that you cannot live without a bank. In this um, system in which we are living, everybody's depending on the financial system, which is a private run system, you know? It's like the government is something else, but everybody needs this. And mm-hmm. if there's a crisis you see how everything collapses. But if the bank or any other private institution says no all of a sudden, then it stops. Then you cannot act anymore because you're absolutely dependent. You need, you need the industry needs the loans, people need account, whatever. Uh, it's just impossible. And this dependency, I think, makes makes me angry, makes people angry because there's no other way. There's no choice anymore. Uh, what would be the ch- what would be the choice? I don't know. That's the question because there is no choice in the because in this world I cannot think without money. I can't. I can, but not effectively right now. And also everything around us, beer and electricity and everything is like behind that is a financial market, mm-hmm. and eventually also interests of people. And um, that's where it becomes complicated. That's where also a, a moral implication comes in. Like, 
you can say, okay, it's not the banker's fault, it's not the bank's fault because they're just opportunists. They're just like any uh, capitalist entity, they're up for optimization, so they try to get the most out of it. That's the sole purpose of an industry. But in this case, it's not because it's almost like a pseudo government in the financial world because they have the same power because you cannot choose. It doesn't make any sense. So they should have also responsibilities similar to a government. Yeah. But is, this is also it, ch it changes in a um, it changes in a society where the nation state doesn't hold power mm -hmm. in the way that it used to, and the way that the um, the power that goes with concentrations of capital is not anchored to the nation state. And where those um, mm -hmm. uh, those kind of apparatuses of power become. <clears throat> Globally unanchored. Yeah. That, yeah, yeah. That, 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 that makes this dynamic much, much more complex yeah. and, uh, of course, and this is very elusive, like, like, like makes kind of responsibility or um, the idea that, that one might be held accountable, one, whatever, <laughs> whatever one, the word one points out here, um, that becomes much more hard to get hold of. Yeah. But what, what sort of responsibility are you talking about? What For example, what earlier happened to me, and it's like a stupid example, I, I'm streaming this video mm -hmm. on YouTube. YouTube decided to change the rules for people using a telephone to live stream, so we have to have no more than 1,000 subscribers for your channel, otherwise you can't do that anymore. I don't have 1,000, I have to eight. <laughs> 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 from a computer, but they treat it this way. And I said, like, I'm fucked. Because, and I figured it out today, which is, of course, stupid. I could have figured it out yesterday or weeks ago, but I didn't know about it. And all of a sudden, you see, you, you make yourself dependent on, on a, something, and if they change the rules, you can't even make a choice anymore. You're just out. Yeah. Luckily, the world operates often. There's like, now I found a different software that creates another like system around this new system. But do you pay for it? Sorry, like a non-visual I was thinking this way of uh, like what you said, like uh, I didn't think about it before, you know. I mean, the way you organize this thing maybe was organized uh, in a way where the way we work today, you know, everything is extremely fast. Uh, and that I uh, rely also on this kind of stress related to time that we have. I mean, if you want to have like uh, um, a soup with beans, you just go and buy the beans in a can. I mean, Ipo, you grow the beans. Mm -hmm. The beans came out. Mm -hmm. You open the beans, you take out the beans. I mean, the soup it comes out like after some months. And this is the same thing. Like, you know, there are problems that uh, we're not. Uh, we're not uh, a able anymore to treat as we were treating it before. Therefore, we have to rely on a certain kind of safeness uh, that is a bit like uh, produced and abstract uh, and comes from like uh, uh, an energy that we don't have. And it's money and it comes from the banks. Yeah, but the safeness is just exactly that's what I mean. The same is not really there because somebody can change the rules because it's yeah. like. Yeah, but it's still like, provide a service. For you, that's yeah, yeah. probably free. So why would they change the rule of the software? Well, this fine is not really free. It's just it comes on the surface free. But um, the point is, they make how dependencies. Do you, how do you pay for it then? When I see the advertisement or stuff. Yeah. Mm -hmm. okay. Well, they're making money out of you using this. It's not like well, they don't give you interest out of the goodness of their heart. Yeah, yeah. If I, <laughs> it's like, it's if I would have thousand yeah. subscribers, I would really probably wouldn't even get money from YouTube because there was personalized advertisement towards an education channel uh, uh, is something I don't know. But this is extreme, like, but we outsource everything, and that also outsourcing like the, the most simple thing, like you know, somebody that, uh, which is simple but like crazy if you think about, you know, like. Uh, people that choose food for us, you know, mm. before people wouldn't do that. Uh, yeah. The family, somebody else would do it because I mean, if you put something that is unhealthy, you die. Right, yeah. And we just, we, we outsource like incredible things now. Mm. So it's like also a matter of uh, the fact that we have learned to 
mm, trust people in a crazy way. Well, also that we're not able to provide for all our own needs anymore. That's for sure. We walked out. I really don't know how we made people. You can watch it on YouTube. <laughs> yeah, yeah, that's true. That's true. But uh, speaking about that, I wanted to ask you, um, just before banks, what was the system that was uh, somehow helping people to go through moments uh, of uh, fine or like carousel or like uh, a wrong winter and stuff like that? Only like uh, collaboration between people that knew each other, families and stuff like that? or? There was something just before banks that was a bit more similar to banks. I mean, like for example, of course there were like uh, cooperative, like storage system. That's for sure. But there were other systems. Um, probably. I mean, as, as you as you're indicating, um, there was more of a tightly sort of knit community system that you can. You could fall back on because one of the things with current model of capitalism is also the the individualism and optimization of society. But um, in terms of in terms of if you're asking about alternative sources of finance mm. uh, in a, to help with some sort of crisis or a disaster, yeah. I can't think of one. Do you? I mean, banks are from the last. They are the first banks were like from. Europe, but isn't like isn't, was, isn't let's say so one person, system. but isn't one person lending someone money, even if he doesn't call himself a bank, kind of a bank? And they take some. You know, like, if they, exactly. Like, I mean, yeah. because that's so like then on a small scale. Yes, yeah, so like the power shop, <laughs> the money lender. Yeah, and, and or like yeah, the kind of stocks, you know. Yeah, mm. uh, and I mean in that situation, mm. if you're going back to sort of. Um, the, um, the I'm thinking of merchants who, um, you know, in the 13th, 14th century, financed the 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 royalty and the the, the monarchs, and in, you know, they they could probably they would probably uh, raise finance in that way to, um, um, you know. To, to address any sort of disaster type issues, but I, I, I don't know. Mm. But also banks are from the West. I mean, like, uh, yeah. maybe there were other systems, uh, I don't know, in Southeast Asia or somewhere else. But what would be a, an alternative system? Because I guess you could also imagine that like, a bank that is not dealing on a financial level, but on a more social level, you know, you know like, that they would take care of your well-being rather than <laughs> you know like out, out of an interest in your well-being rather than out of an interest in you know and mm. yeah. enrichment in, or something yeah. Like. yeah is there a bank that is not 100 percent profit oriented more like again they're more, like, more like cooperatives right <clears throat> where sort of the cooperative enterprises that um come together not with a view sort of non non-profit type organizations is that is that what you mean? Well, yeah. I mean, those still exist, obviously. But that's when I just like, <laughs> went banana, but when I moved to um, London, I needed in a bank account because I look through the banks and where should I go? They seem to be all the same. And at the end, you find some difference because their orientations, they like invest in renewable energy as the main mm. aim. Others don't invest into weapon industries, and yeah. others don't save where they invest. That means they invest in everything. Else as well. Yeah. Uh, um, that is criteria, I guess. No, it's like um, how you can act. I don't know, more responsible to work with the world and the people, or to really grow business. Um, mm. And um, but however, yeah, I guess but they, they're all they they make these decisions also based on their business. Yeah, they absolutely. believe. Okay, if I don't invest in in uh, the weapons industry, I would probably gain more uh, uh, clients mm -hmm. who like that. 
So it's, it's again, it's all the same in the end. I mean, you know. But also, can, right. is that from the same trust that information? Like, is that I really true it. when they claim that? Or like, can they, might they be able to claim that if it's actually not true? I doubt that, actually. I think it would be easily verifiable if yeah. I breached it. Um, mm -hmm. And there will be a business model, as you say. I mean, they would have calculated, I would imagine, um, what the what kind of customer base they're appealing to, um, and you know, their sort of this kind of um, social responsibility aspect will be part of their sort of business plan and business strategy. Yeah, it's just marketing. So. Yeah, well, you could say that. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Um, but um, coming back to this, like, quite, there was one thing that happened. Like the other day, I was looking for a room for this event, and before I could do it here, I was thinking of another venue in, in, in London to host it, which has more like a, uh, a socialist implication background. And so I asked them, I have this friend of mine, she's alive in Deutsche Bank, she wants to talk about this topic here and um, we want to talk about it critically and then I got an answer and said like oh yeah no we are like um, we are an institution for like no, yeah, radical politics education and change and the last thing we want is having a banker talking in our house and I was like I didn't even think that that I would get this answer and then I thought of it yeah I I understand that somehow but it also seems a little bit narrow minded because it seems so categorically without uh, any further reflection, everything that has to do with banking, we have to oppose by nature. And I wonder like two things, how it comes us to these like, strong reactions and these opposing positions that are not even open for reflection anymore. Mm -hmm. And yeah, why are then, after the time what you said, like still st bankers, the hated ones in the banking industry, because we also figured out that the responsibility lies in many places, like it starts with yeah. the people who take a loan that they can't uh, pay back and they know that from the beginning. Mm. Is it then um, you can't blame them because it was offered to them, so they can't make um, a reasonable judgment about the situation? Is it the bankers who always want to greedy stuff, they want to like maximize their outcome, even though they know somebody will have to pay for that, but whoever that is. I mean, where do you start in this like, critique? But it comes back to once, like, we don't like the bank, we don't like Merrill Lynch and Deutsche Bank and everyone. And if all these people walk out with their boxes in their hand, as you described in the invitation, then some people say like, oh yeah, they really deserve that. And I'm not sure about that. Mm. But there's also just people who are on the bank for that. Yeah, you know, I, 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 I simply find that. No, no, 100%. But I just try to look out of many perspectives. But there's a, also a lot of those people also still want to own a house and would like to get that money, a mortgage from the bank. You know, like I just yeah. think there's like a very weird double standard. Yeah. There's a disconnect completely. Mm. It's, it's this kind of the, as I was saying earlier, this kind of anger and blame, you know, and placing responsibility all, all on the banks. Oh, it's nothing. The debt bubble was nothing to do with us. Yeah. That there was also a kind of a matter of like education, like uh, the bank was uh, made in that way because it was guaranteeing like a, a sort of safeness to people that were not like uh, didn't know about it. So I mean, in a way, uh, of course there is uh, there is the ignorance of the investor or, or the person that mm -hmm. did this wrong move, but I think that the bank responsibility comes way before that. Mm. I mean, there is a kind of a... Legally, maybe not, because after all, it's all in the paper. <laughs> yeah, 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 but still, like, you know, <laughs> banks were, like, um, giving a service to people. You know, like, yeah. uh, if you go to a person that tell you, look, uh, I think you should do this and this, uh, and diversify your thing, your money in this and this way, there was people that until the day before they were like, uh, I don't know. Yeah, but I mean, one not thing. Not even selling stuff because they were not even like. Uh, 
uh, dealers or stuff. They were like maybe people working in a factory or in a place, normal place. Yeah, but it's not someone who gives you free advice. You're a client if you go to a bank, and they're trying to sell you something. It's a very simple transaction, no? And so I think like some, <laughs> like you're not going to, I don't know. Yeah, but but, but when yeah, but like, I take that that's Christian's point: the fact that you don't have any choice but to be involved with them. Yeah, yeah, hundred <laughs> so percent. So yeah. Yeah. Mm. yeah. But then it's also, what are your expectations, right? Like, how much do you want to use them? If you hate them, that's fine, but then how much do you want to mm. learn them? And I guess you can minimize that by minimizing your interactions with the bank. Yeah, but that is hardly no, possible completely. because you're yeah, very no, independent. It's, it's and the frustration is like, whatever you do, you can't get around. And yeah. they decide, actually, for you, if you get this house or not. Well, you could save the money until you can actually buy it without getting the mortgage. That brings us in a different situation that here in London, the, <laughs> the price of houses are in relation to what they actually worth. It's like disproportional, no? It's like if you compare that to you have to go where many yeah, other countries in Europe put the same house on the market, it costs like, I don't know, half of it. But I'm sure also lots of people here in London who are able to buy houses. I'm not sure if they're actually ever able to pay off their mortgages because their mortgages are probably like, you have to pay them off for 80 years. It's very unlikely that you live that long, you know. So all of these things. Why do like, you do that then? Why, why do you have well, it's because you then, you use the bank and the system to, you know, get that, that one that you bought and then so that on. Okay. Oh, okay. Exactly. The value goes. Yeah. So like everybody is actually speculating. I mean, yeah, we're speculating, speculating and also interested in this in this game. So, you know, and prices <laughs> going up in the you know. Yeah, but there you go. That that's it. Now that's the same. Then you're not better than no you're institution. You do no, the exactly. same thing. No, exactly. Exactly. And so then the blame was on you. <laughs> Mm. Um, oh, but it's then it's it, this is the system. What do what what position do I take in relationship to it? Do I you, do I try and play it the same way in order to, yeah. to, to come get some of the same benefits from it, or do I look for a way to try and minimise? Mm. Like, but that's the responsibility you you're talking about, I guess, right? Yeah, uh, yeah, exactly. And I think the best thing I can come up with is. Um, to have to, to have a sort of a all rounded and informed discussion about it rather yeah. than sort of uh, have a black and white thinking, you know, one side is wrong, the other side is right. Are you are you sorry, are you I'm wondering, are you ever in a position where you have to find a, uh, find some sort of loopholes for things that are <laughs> technically uh, they, I mean, they kind of look illegal, but when you have a plan to make them legal, I mean, I'm sure that's also something you, I don't um, know, I mean, I don't know if that's your particular the legal department. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. Oh exactly. Show me no, your like, I mean, as you, like, I think the, the way you started was very interesting, where you described these two sides of liquidity, you know, like on the one hand, like a bank stimulates the economy, stimulates business, creates... Mm -hmm work or, mm -hmm. um, and then on the other hand like there's all this tranching and like com mm -hmm. very complicated yeah. systems yeah. so I'm sure mm -hmm. with all these very complicated systems you as lawyers <laughs> yeah, um, become quite busy yeah I mean with with uh, complicated things I mean we would um, I wouldn't say we would ever find loopholes or trying to mm -hmm. sort of um, uh, do I mean clearly not do something that's expressly uh, prohibited, um, and you know the the, the 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 there is this kind of um, and now actually when I started in the, in this industry um, and, and joined a financial institution at that point already there was. In the aftermath of the financial crisis, there's huge, huge amounts of regulation. So now, mm. actually, banks have banks have a lot of rules uh, to 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 um, comply with. So um, I think that that kind of uh, temptation <laughs> no, <laughs> has been removed. No, of but course. it's also a matter of like uh, interpretation of rules or of, or yeah. of because I guess there's like humans involved in. 
in all of this. And humans, you know, make mistakes and humans interpret mm -hmm. things maybe loosely or more strictly. And then I guess it's your job to be, mm -hmm. you know, maybe, you know, looking at the rules and saying, okay, could be looked at this in that way or that way. Or yeah, and also like when you, when these kind of very complicated financial products are yeah. created, who, I mean, that must be legally quite complex to create them, right? Also. Yeah, I mean, it's um, uh, little, I mean, it, it's, it's more the, the complexity of it is more the sort of the <coughs> mathematical side of it, so mm -hmm. the, sort of the, the techie side of it, um, and the legal side of it is, is this, is this, is this allowed? How do you trade this? Mm -hmm. you know, what do you have to come up? Where do you have to report this? Um, mm -hmm. You know, that, that sort of stuff. And, it doesn't, I would say, James, that it may raise moral questions. <laughs> where you're thinking, should I be facilitating? Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. But legal, I mean, okay. the legality issue doesn't really arise, right? Uh, I wouldn't say. Um, but I still find this question. Reputation. So the other thing is, like, um, in, in our function, it's, it's not just legal risk and legal issues we look at, but reputation. Oh, yeah. Well. So reputation is, yeah. is important. So Moral and reputational side of things, we also we also yeah. do consider. So um, um, then, we're, but, also we are gatekeepers. So how about things like insider trading or things that are actually oh, legal? Sure. Like that's that's the absolute sort of no no. It's, it's a very strict system yeah. in place, and I know there are sort of um, uh, very well publicized kind of financial fraud uh, <laughs> things happening you know uh, with funds as for the made off scandal but with within <clears throat> the investment banks aren't familiar with the regulation of the yeah insider trading is, is very very strict yeah um, it's a more interesting and complicated thing here i just look i'm thinking i work in education and i'm hit like I'm just thinking, I can map everything that you're saying across onto the education. Really? Well, but pretty much in terms of, because everything that I do as a, as a teacher as, yeah. is, um, is within my job description, it's within the understood kind of paradigms of, of, of education, it's within kind of the university's mission set, you know, it's like all yeah, that stuff yeah, is in place. Yeah. And I'm like, <laughs> I'm, a, I'm a cog. I've, I've had many jobs where my feeling is I am a cog in the machine that I ought to be dismantling and I'm helping it to run yeah. smoothly. And the ethical issue yeah. there in terms of like, how am I, I have this relationship with these very, very direct relationship with students. And on the one hand, I'm doing these things to do the best for them that I can, but I also understand that by doing this in a way that doesn't disrupt the smooth running of the university as it currently stands, mm. I'm maintaining this system which I know is a fucked system mm. and not what it ought to be. Mm. So you're so you're always caught between or I I, I, I use the university, I don't mean you. <laughs> One <laughs> in this situation feels that you're like again I'm kind of thinking about the how it's not a simple thing to talk about responsibility. It's yeah. not a simple thing yeah. to talk about what how one ought to act because we're yeah. caught within this web and we have we found ourselves in this situation somehow, and then you're in this dilemma mm. where um, the black and the white of it is not so easily separated. But no. uh, maybe it's also very simple on the other hand, so maybe you just enter contracts that you're actually able to comprehend, you know, <laughs> like go, go intellectually, go if I'm not able to read the contract and comprehend yeah. it with, with, the, with the help of a lawyer or legal advisor, Maybe then I don't sign it, you know. Well, like, I, wouldn't have someone, I wouldn't have somewhere to live if that was the case because when I was sorting out this stuff with my flat, you wouldn't have put in the contract. It yeah. Was just, there were, it was like it was like a piece of really it was like James Joyce or <laughs> <laughs> interminable sentences. But that's what but that's what the, 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 the meaning but just I'm, fell out of the book. But, but yeah, because you're not a trained lawyer, but I'm sure this was probably a very standard contract that m many people but here my, signed. My lawyer couldn't help me make oh. a standard either. Okay. Oh, but I'm sure it would have been possible to find someone who, who could comprehend. If I had the money. <laughs> yeah, but you know, it's, but like, I mean, it's okay, but. So you you signed something and you actually not told me something. No, I didn't. <laughs> <laughs>
Oh, yeah. But that's what I mean. You talk about these responsibilities and how you have to act to make things actually work. But in the end, it's like that can also that also sounds not right in a way. It's like it has to lie somewhere. No, it's like you can make contracts abstract and complicated. So it's also like a, a, a disguise of responsibility in the end because you try to get away with something that you can probably hide in some corner of a sentence that's actually really important. I don't know. It seems to like that all these systems that are at work here are so like, huge that everybody only seems to like hopefully maintain them a little bit for the time being they're involved in that and that's all you can get in it like be it a teacher or, or be it a banker or I don't know mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. it seems a little bit strange but it's not strange but when you look at it from the outside it seems very strange that everybody's just trying to keep it together it's kind of like I wonder if you if your landlord in setting up your contract also had a legal team that was the the moral gatekeeper <laughs> or the the reputation keeper, you know? Probably not. And it's I find it quite interesting that you're saying, you know, I guess you have the in the banking you have the uh, the revenue generating mm -hmm. side of things and then you have the legal team the, the, the reputation yeah. keepers and yeah no, but then uh I guess, I mean, yeah, you could have, you know, marketing or PR department that is the reputational side of things, but it's interesting that it's illegal. Yeah, it's You know, that you, you think of yourself or the department or that branch as the yes. moral but still you conscience work. of the yeah. bank. It's quite interesting. But you still work for the bank, so you also act in their interest. So no, of course, yeah. Different. I mean, it is. I guess it is in the interest of the bank to be, you know, to have a good reputation and to be morally sound. Because if they're nice. not, then it's, in the end it's going to be bad for business because that's what it comes down to. They're not doing it because they want to be good no. people no. Yeah. as a bank, right? They, they want to make money and they probably make more money if they're with sound reputation than if they have, you know, if they're the, the terrible thing. And I guess it's a quite a big task because of this idea that everybody has of the evil banker. Right? Like of, of what we're talking about is that everybody thinks of the banker as the, yeah. you know, the person who's faultless that yeah. everybody lost their houses. Yeah. Yeah, and so, so, so the reputational damage is easily triggered because that prejudice or sort of preconception is already there. So, yeah, so it's, um, it, it had to be extra cautious where that type of reputational risk could be involved. I guess it's, in, you know, how the, I guess the image of the money lender mm -hmm. has been used uh, or abused or like frowned upon or point that in history quite a lot and then when you think about it I guess Jewish uh, mm. uh, uh, people were in the money yeah. business a lot and then were used as the mm. uh, the person to blame but yeah. often yeah. also just for like the personal capitalist reason because they also want yeah, to yeah, yeah, yeah like exactly the blame, so yeah, it's it's the blame. blame to do for example the blame. Yeah. but also it's a power I mean it's also I guess the, the thing that is upsetting about it is just the power that you hold when you like if you go somewhere and you ask someone for money and that person gives you the money they have an enormous amount of power over you and right but because the other side like, is like you don't want to pay back in an ideal way so you try to blame the one who's <laughs> lending the money that <laughs> just know, is an evil way. person <laughs> Yeah, yeah. That comes back with the example. Of, I mean, like, they can make requests yeah. if you're not able to pay in the in the installments that you agreed on, and that's always like that's like the basic plot of so many novels, or the yeah. side aspect of so many novels. You know, mm -hmm. that's when the, the, <laughs> the ruins start, things start going badly. When, people, like, I don't know, like, and then you know, I think it's it comes. And there are also it's all a very this, basic. Uh, there is all this literature where there is the mob that. Uh, also lend money and like you know if you don't pay in time they break your thumb after like that the more the reputation of the no, but it's really <laughs> i think they have been really mixed together like you know uh, money lenders that are were, like private and affiliated yeah. to criminal organization and uh, institution banks and, yeah you know, like loan sharks yeah yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. and the debt collector mm -hmm. yeah <laughs> 
But what is it exactly that you are working on then? Because we always we instantly jumped into this subprime <laughs> stuff and housing market mortgages and people who lost their existence. Is that what you're dealing with on a day to day basis? No, actually, um, I'm, I'm, I'm dealing with. Um, so I, uh, I, I advise on transactions, so cross border financing. So, you know, I mentioned sort of sovereign lending um, or syndicated lending. Um, like you, you have, uh, when, when you have a need for a large infrastructure project like that, of a, transportation or even sort of public, I mean, governments use large bank syndicates for uh, financing you know, public pro financing projects like Don't they have money on their own? Like stupid question. No. <laughs> <laughs> uh, and, you know, yeah, so hospitals, schools, you name it. So the, the banks get together and um, uh, provide a loan and uh, normally there, there are vast amounts of documentation, legal documentation to, to, to you know, um, formalize that, the, the, that uh, sort of lending arrangement. So that's my kind of daily... And you facilitate these transactions? Yes, yeah, so I'm the um, legal function within Deutsche Bank. So there would be, the investment banks are divided into front office, middle office and back office. And front office is your revenue generating function. So, you know, the bankers, which are themselves divided into Structures, traders, salesmen, um, you know, coverage, you know, they, they have different functions. They are the sort of client facing or front side of the bank, and then middle office, which is one of the uh, legal, legal department, is one of the functions in the, in the middle office. And you have others um, which are about controlling risk. So we have the credit risk um, uh, management. Function. We have a market risk management function, and we have compliance um, and compliance function. We look at reputational risks as well and insider trading issues. You know, they they have complex systems set up with the control room and who in the bank is, um, what information, um, um, what teams have what information in the bank. So if if you if, if it's called public private side device. So if you're on the public side, you can only have access to information that mm. can be read by anybody in the price. Um, um, and if you're on the private side, you know, there's a very strict law. You have some information which is price sensitive, is inside information, and you don't mix the two. Well, well you no, know, it just reminds me that this Monty Python sketch where I remember they came up with like a deadly song that would kill the Nazis, and so uh, the British army. It's, 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 oh, it's a joke. It's a joke. It's a joke. That is the deadly yeah. joke, exactly. And so uh, the the army, <laughs> like, everyone was just. Allowed to know a word or two of the yeah. stuff. So thanks, <laughs> Lee, for, for correcting that. <laughs> that super reminds me a little bit of that. <laughs> and then they how was it? How did it end that they it came out and yeah, they all laughed? Nice. And then, <laughs> <laughs> I haven't seen that sketch. Yeah. Which, which one is it? Which, um, Monty Python? Monty Python sketch. Yeah, it's very awesome. Yeah, we'll we, we find it and send you Yeah, I got <laughs> Um, so what was I saying? So yes, yeah, so and then we have the back office, which is sort of operations, um, payments, um, processing, clearing, that, that, that sort of stuff. Um, so uh, basically, and the front office do the sort of client relationship stuff and structuring, and then the legal function is there to to make sure that you know, the, the, all the legal risks are identified. You know, if, if you're lending in a particular jurisdiction, who is your counterparty? You know, what is, you know, you look at their sort of legal capacity or authority, can, are they you know, um, able to perform their obligations? Are those um, enforceable in that jurisdiction? You know, all, all sorts of, sort of legal stuff. But the reputational aspect does, does come to it. Um, um, so yeah, I, I, that's my kind of daily bread and butter. Is, is, and is there like a, um, are they international yes. route? Because obviously you have like lots of different countries or banks from different yeah. countries. 
lending to other countries and I don't know, like say China and Africa. Yeah. For yeah. and I guess are they bound to the same rules as the Deutsche Bank here in the UK? Or is it so they, the lender and syndicate would be sort of the London market, so uh, it would be if I understand your um, question correctly, you can have you can have most international banks are represented in London, so you would have okay. you would have those entities forming the forming the syndicate and um, lending on a cross border basis, governed by mutual. So it's hmm. it's, um, it, it's basically that's why London is the financial center of the world because it's. Um, is driven from London and driven by by initial documentation. So and what will happen if uh, uh, England will then leave uh, Europe uh, in this? Uh, <laughs> 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 in three <laughs> sentences. <laughs> 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 Split on these three countries, and they're all performed quite differently, I guess. Now, are the rules all the same? Down the uh, well, so, so the, the point of it is so I think just to explain, so US banks uh, and, and US banks are massive, right, in, in finance, um, and they have huge market capitalization. They use London as uh, historically as, as, as a base to provide services to all of the European Union, right? So when I say that hub will move, so that there will, instead of as London will no longer be, or may no longer be part of the EU, then uh, the alternative would be for them to go somewhere else in the EU. And then the question is whether that's going to be Paris, and Dublin, or Rotterdam. And the, 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 I think the view is that one single location cannot possibly accommodate uh, the infrastructure that's required mm -hmm. for this transition. So in London's massive, right, and yeah. has every, all the all the paraphernalia set up for the financial system to function. Uh, and you, there's no single location like. Trump what would be the, what is the paraphernalia? Um, the, 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 from the sort of the the, the, the physical. Um, Systems and the technology and, and, and clearing services uh, to things like basic things like you know lots of um, people who work in banking are not actually yeah. British and they bring their families over to and, and the education system the housing yeah. and everything else. I mean you're talking about huge numbers. I mean it's the, those kind of things that. Um, May have to change, right? But it's still interesting. That maybe goes in, in a different direction now. But uh, related to leaving the EU, seems like Britain seems willing to give all this away, which seems like a big part of their economy, and the system seems optimized for this European market. But still, is there like another financial game behind it that nobody knows about? But there must yeah. be something. What is, what is it? Yeah, they always say they want Singapore style. Uh, yeah. I mean, is that not, what does that mean? They're not giving up on what they have. At least in the German newspapers, they always talking about how uh, Boris Johnson wants to achieve a Singapore style. But they always say, what is this like, mean? no yeah. way they're going to achieve it. Like, like, kind of like a tax haven, oh, yeah. very uh, few laws or regulations. <laughs> I don't know. Like, what it's like, not, I don't really know. Like tropical, but wow. <laughs> But it's a question, no? Yeah, the more is that the more the less Singapore. <laughs> is, that, is that true? Is, is something like this even possible, or is it something you read in the sun because it sounds good? I think Brexit is probably argue that um, um, 
it gives them access to the rest of the world and Europe is in decline. I mean, it's not, not being part of the EU is not stopping them from trading with, with China, India and uh, other big economies. And those kind of developing or emerging or already emerged economies are a bigger platform, a bigger market for, for, for Britain. I think that would be, that would be the argument. But mm. As things stand, you know, the EU is our biggest trader. So, um, there you go. So, and you don't know any any, any secret. You don't know if you might want us to know. It's just you going to tell us. How to solve Brexit. <laughs> yeah, yeah. On the topic of Brexit. I wish. I wish. <laughs> I wish. Um, but yeah, it's, uh, there are big changes that happen. Brexit is going to happen. But yeah, what will be the effect on big banks? Yeah, what for you, for example? Yeah. What does that mean? Who both of you? Right. Oh, people Frankly. like you see this thing. I mean, <laughs> it's like a, a something that where banks might gain or where they will lose. Banks in London, I mean. Um, I think banks will continue as they are. It's just the location will change. I mean, London probably will lose out, and people. I mean, there are different views on this. I don't know, James. Please, but Sounds like a lot of empty apartments all of a sudden. Yeah. A lot of what we do is regulated activity. We can only perform that activity within the EA when London ceases to be, um, the United Kingdom ceases to be part of the EA. We won't be able to perform those functions from outside the EA into the EA. Hmm. What's the EA, sorry? European Economic Area. Okay. So um, it is inevitable that uh, certain regulated activity can only be performed in the EEA, whether that means that people decide to perform that from Amsterdam or Paris or Dublin, that each institution has its own planning and its own approach. And depends. obviously, uh, I mean, the French banks will no doubt move towards Paris and the German banks will move towards Germany and so forth. But um, there are undoubtedly big changes what happen will inevitably follow if uh, Brexit happens. So does that mean also English banks basically just a big chunk of their business just you fall away because they, they cannot actually engage with No, that. they still form uh, subsidiaries in, yeah. in okay. the EU yeah. and continue to form Yeah. So okay. my point was that banks and financial will continue their services somehow in some form they will subsidiarize or have a branch in the EA in the European Union. It's London that will be mm. affected potentially. Yeah. Uh, yeah. Is the point. So global international business, it will move and um, companies all around the world will continue to need money or continue to come to banks to raise money and help them perform their functions, whatever they do. They do a whole raft of different activities to me it's just touched on a couple of them. Um, but there will be a undoubtedly be a significant effect on London and therefore on the UK economy. Mm. Because if you think about the amount of tax which is generated by these activities which goes on to fund schools and hospitals. So banks don't really have a neutral position in this thing. Do you mean neutral? That they say either or we no. will go on, we don't care. Also, in in England they will have a kind also, of say neutral enough, but um, Clearly, there are costs involved, uh, people costs, infrastructure costs, rent costs of institutions that are uprooting. You're talking potentially about vast numbers of people and um, only multiplies across the whole city, for example. If everybody's going to go move to Amsterdam. That needs to help a lot of people move with their families to Amsterdam. You've got to set up offices and offices in Amsterdam, you've got to pay rent in Amsterdam, you've got to move your computer systems to Amsterdam, you've got to yeah. adopt everything under the Dutch There's a huge cost for businesses to take on, and that will obviously have an effect on, instead of spending money developing and generating new jobs for people, they'll have to spend it on readjusting for Brexit. Because, uh, no. It's just, just a of it. Which will have, it have like a, an effect uh, on a, also on a quite long time. Yeah. Probably also going to buy less art to take <laughs> advantage of it. <laughs> That's for sure. <laughs> that is pretty yeah. Which is, you know, <laughs> interesting for us. <laughs> Not really. That's the <laughs> <sad job. laughs> <laughs> hmm. hmm. Yeah.
but I guess Frankfurt, I mean, they're, I don't know, I guess they're these places like Frankfurt or Dublin or Paris, they were like getting ready, no? Yeah, I mean, isn't it like, I, don't know, I, read, I read about how they're well, kind of like shuffling, <laughs> yeah, like into position to yeah. be, like not only uh, be able to accommodate these numbers of people, but also being able to kind of uh, provide a level of lifestyle that is, mm -hmm. you know, adequate or desirable for uh, moving a bank there. Which is quite... Which I guess... Which we already said. No, no, but I, I guess London has, like, is, yeah, like the paraphernalia is, involves a lot, like, not only housing, but also, like, schools, but also, I don't know, entertainment, <laughs> yeah. whatever, I don't know, leisure stuff. Mm. And then... I guess other places, I mean... Yeah, but they're, yeah, most of the time, I guess, the capitals of countries, except Frankfurt. Frankfurt also has enough. Yeah. So do you think you, you will be here, or you will be going to Frankfurt? <laughs> <laughs> Nobody does. <laughs> what happens to the 18,000 people who Deutsche Bank is um, laying off? I read in the newspaper. <laughs> <laughs> 18,000 people. That seems like a lot of people. What happened there? Uh, How can it be that you uh, uh, We are uh, Deutsche Bank, I think, is now a vision to, well, uh, uh, that's also been sort of publicly um, disclosed and announced of sort of going back to more sort of corporate lending commercial banking instead sort of, of things. So reducing its investment banking, sort of pure investment banking um, um, activity and it has exited certain businesses which um, So you have to quickly clarify again uh, the difference between now uh, what's the specificity then of investment banking in relation to like corporate banking. Yeah so cor corporate banking uh, is or commercial banking is basically lending to, to businesses Corporates. The classic um, model of like yeah, companies for yeah. production buying goods, they get money. And yeah. So it's a, a symbiotic system almost between the bank and the yeah. company. Yeah. And um, the investment banking? And the sort of more pure investment banking is um, offering the financial products, I suppose, so the, the trading aspect of it, so securities trading. Um, so, for example, you know, there are lots of activities encompassed in that, so, such as um, underwriting bond issues or advising governments or the corporations on the issue of bonds or other securities, you know, um, rights issues, you know, when companies issue new shares, um, um, uh, and, and, and then once that's been done, bonds and equities have been issued, then you move to the secondary market where they're traded. You know, they can buy and sell bonds and shares and other securities. Okay. And, uh, so it's a detached version of like it doesn't interact with reality anymore, like a company with, with the bank. It's more like the secondary market. Like secondary buying, selling, buying. It's also yes. <laughs> like you have like a thing that's abstract yeah. and it costs something. Yeah. That's what you call a financial product, I guess. No? Yes, yeah, so the, the derivatives I mentioned and also are part of that kind of second. Uh, okay. you know, the, 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 the secondary activity, yeah. so you, you then build other products that protect you in some way um, or help you speculate in some way on the, on, the original, on the original asset and that's a kind of more pure investment banking side of things. Okay, yeah. And, um, I don't make sense. That's also where the subprime idea is located. Yes, the sort of packaging of loans and yeah. issuing it's actually quite an interesting part of banking because it's almost as creative as making art. Uh, because you have to be so clever in the. Are they almost? Oh. <laughs> <laughs> no, no, sorry. You're right. This might be even more creative because it goes like they use everything that's really necessary to like refracture. Like, okay, I say if you would express these methods into a drawing, I think it could be quite interesting because you have to make it very yeah. deep. Only <laughs> that it has to be functional. Yeah, the big problem with it is this kind of uh, this very clever mathematical models and sort of deductive models that they sort of, sort of like aim to create this closed system that you know that, that has no 
relation to reality because um, you know we're back into this kind it's of just like that. <laughs> 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 yeah it's um, um, yeah so it has no relation for example it doesn't it gets so complex that the bankers themselves and we mentioned Greenspan, um, the, the chief of the Federal Reserve at the time of the stock market, and he even admitted that you know he didn't understand these products, and the bank, the the the, the, the people involved in banking couldn't price them; they couldn't assess what the risk was because yeah. there was so, so much complexity. But because of this departure. but but you do remember them, but you cannot assess them because they're too complicated. It seemed like almost useless. Well, you just price them and talk to the best, but then, okay. you know. that's also an interesting question of responsibility because you're still going on to sell them to someone and you're actually not quite sure what you're selling. So, woohoo, evil investors, they're also buying stuff that they actually have no clue what, you know, it's the same thing, it's James Joyce, it's like, no idea what I'm buying. I trust the bank, so, you know, but like, where's the... I mean, I think it goes both ways, right? Yeah. So. But if it's an algorithm, so kind of mathematical yeah. function, um, it's like uh, you can replicate it, uh, and that's what you sell. But can people, like, do you sell this also as a product to, to other enterprises, or is it something that you just use for your own? No, you sell it to the markets, you sell it to hedge funds, you sell it to investors. Is, is that your question? You, mm. It's not just the banks who are sort of devising these products and using it for themselves. They're, they're also, they're, they're also um, offering this to, to their clients. Yeah, and, 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 and but they the use it, the, the clients use it or they own it. They invest in it. They get yeah, yeah, but I mean, they invest in this kind of packet that is produced by a kind of algorithm. Mm -hmm. But the, let's say the algorithm itself, like the rule that you have for like uh, design, can be also sold. Oh, I see what you mean. Yeah. Um, let's say you have patented this thing. Yeah, I don't yeah. even know if you patented so it. Yeah, the money-making machine. Yeah, it's like... I'm aware of I always have to think of the shoes and the sausages he made. <laughs> <laughs> You know, Marco made a project where he, he just talked about it every day, where he like made salami in sneakers. So I have to be in a sneaker because it's kind of like this like undefined thing in the financial market. I don't know how to bury salami in the front. It smells like a good thing. Surely somebody wants to cut it in pieces. Nobody knows how to sell it. Exactly. It's somewhere in a basement. Huh? Just, so you rest the bank, bank's algorithms for the complex products, but they wouldn't sell it, to my knowledge. It would be, they call it proprietary. And model. you wouldn't sell your recipe, either. Um, <laughs> no, but, uh, I mean, it's something that uh, can be... Replicated. Yeah. I don't understand exactly, it's a bit too obsessed. I don't understand, I don't understand either. Okay. As in how the algorithms uh, work in the sense of, can they be replicated? Presumably... Um, or they are custom modify everything, yeah. I don't know. But still, the question is who puts the value on these things? If you still random, then if you don't, kind of, because there might be orientations in connection with what's in the package. The who has touched it? But isn't there, like, anyways, isn't there like a, 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 a more a growing reliability or reliance on a computer? Yeah, he was well, algorithms running yeah. systems that you don't really know, uh, don't understand anymore. Mm -hmm. Also, with this, like the trading being like you know this like super fast trading that is like you know mm -hmm. the computers do without the algorithms do, and nobody really knows yeah. what they're doing. Yeah, but it's but they're making it's money. They're pulling uh, like risk data. So it's just like many, and it's super. Yeah, I know, but, but it, I think it's, it's like, like uh, exactly. But it's so it's like kind of like handing over what used to be people on the floor going, yeah. you know, and they, they hand that over to to this algorithm, mm. and in the end, there's like money coming out or not, but they, you know, they kind of pass off but this. Uh, because you're right, the, the sort of the digitalization of it on the technological side of it is a completely different story. 
and, and the high frequency of trading, which is crazy. Sorry. In the, I don't remember when, I think in the 80s, or there was this, uh, um, how do you call this kind of uh, game where you like uh, guess which team have won or horses? Betting. Yeah, but it's like it's like a kind of paper thing where you cross the things. Uh, in Italy, it was like a total couch. It was like about something. Like a lottery or what? Kind of. Yeah. But you had like, you know, you could say... Bookmakers. Like a they win, yeah. they lose, or they go pair. Mm. And in the 80s, you could buy a system. Mm. So you had a really high probability to win, but you, the system was something that would have been done by a number of people. Right. And so you would have won less. Right. Because it was divided uh, mm -hmm. and uh, it was interpolling the data and stuff. So, in a way, it's a little bit like. Uh, mm. That's when, yeah. And that's, like that's why I was. Investing in a fund. Like, that's very similar. And then you. Or, like, yeah. The, 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 I think the principle of it is the same with betting. If somebody in, in the market thinks, you know, uh, so, something will go up in price and they buy it. By that and so someone else thinks yeah. they want. So it's 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 you have the two opposites and that's where the movement and the, the trading way more market complex market. So because there yeah. you had like uh, win lose uh, <laughs> and care and then there you have like uh, fluctuation that are like uh, mm. on a massive scale. Yeah. But yeah, also obviously that's also the advantage because if more people come together who. We'll they chuck all their money together and you can actually buy loads of different things and then the likelihood that maybe some of them is up and maybe none of them is down so everyone can have prop I mean, you know, that's, I guess that's how it works. Rather than... I'm very curious about these people designing this system. <laughs> yeah, yeah. I, I mean, right. are they, are they <laughs> owning money or in what way? Are they super rich? Are they... <laughs> They're geese, geese of some kind that <laughs> don't get any money out of it. Yeah, they're geeks and they love it. They do, do they it think of themselves as involved in banks? It seems so after it doesn't really matter. Yeah. They're like artists, they don't get any money. <laughs> <laughs> right? They just love it. They get, they get isotonic energy drink. We <laughs> 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 have free drinks. It's so good. <laughs> then they get a new <laughs> man. Yeah. But is it people with an incredible experience or is it like young people that are just like into like uh, tech? <laughs> no, actually it's... Um, Teens? Or... My understanding of it is that they are sort of super talented, super bright, um, you know, mass geniuses really. It's, um, and so, so this, I mean surely this then is going to, this algorithm and whatever, they, they're going to go into also the lending and into the you yeah. know, loans and whatever the people, you know, yeah. you, you will be, you know, you, you apply for something and there's an algorithm that figures it out within a second where they, like what the probability is of you being able to pay back, mm. you know, your loan and a half, whatever, which then I guess makes it more complicated for you to yeah, how do you understand the with an algorithm? Of the failure of an algorithm, <laughs> yeah, yeah. yeah. responsibility for that. Is that like who is it then that poor geek that sits there who gets blamed yeah, for the for the twenty twenty five crash? <laughs> 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 like eating his nuts and pain. What? I would imagine this is where what? risk and probability get. This is about legality so much as like it's the decision to take certain kinds of risks. If no. you're working with probability. Yeah, but so, um, is, that, is that something that impinges on your work right now? No, not really, because this would be um, a massive disclosure to the investors who, who use this uh, algorithm that a bank came up with, this clever thing, and 
masses of disclosure about you know how there could be risks associated with it and the probability of failure and blah blah blah. blah. And they basically would refer to these things as big boy arrangements. You know, you are a big boy.
Is that a losing? Is that a losing? There's no end to it. Yeah, but there are, there are many of those. Uh, yeah, yeah. And they are uh, so distributed uh, that oh, so I guess it's not only one that this. makes you lose it. Yeah, but is there any loser? Is it endlessly spinning around? It's, it's, it's still a strange thought. Yeah, I guess when the bubble bursts. No. But there's not always there, a there bubble. There are losses right? that need to be absorbed and then, yeah, it starts over again. Because if you buy a banana, you, you eat it and then it's gone, it's transformed into nutrition. It's not the same with... There's no end need for it. Uh, you miss stone. <laughs> what? You miss stone. <laughs> I don't know. I'm just okay. trying to make sense out of, out of the abstraction, because you can also ignore it, making sense, and then here yeah, yeah, you have it on and it's just the same thing. Whatever happens to it on the other side, because it just passed through my investment bank. Or you can think what happens to the things in the end, because there must be an accumulation of products coming, coming, coming. They cannot be unpacked like But they are physical. Them. Yeah, but they exist because they are, exist of money. So, yeah. I think the recycling is what happens where you unwind it, where you restructure it into something else. Because with an artwork, in the end, somebody may want to put it on the wall and say, like, mercy <laughs> to the artwork, I enjoy it. Yeah. I don't know what happens with the financial product, you don't hang it on the wall. It's not tangible, it. right? It's just like. Yeah. There's your, nothing in there. It's a figment of your imagination. <laughs> yeah, you need to go to Tino Sagal, not like you. Know, oh, yeah, okay. Well, you can see this. the numbers on your backstage. Yeah, but it won't put stops because you don't sell it on anymore. You just but, uh, yeah, well, that's where you have to get rid of it. Are these products like uh, something that you buy, let's say, for a very long time or like it, or let's say you diversify this investment as yeah. they told you to do with yeah. this uh, yeah. product that you buy or is something that uh, you do it uh, and then it has a kind of uh, let's say sure, develop right. no a development something that uh, uh, is not only like uh, there but is something that might uh, develop in time so that you go on in that way afterwards or it's just like uh, you buy that batch Finished. When you buy it, and then you have to resell it if you want to make some money anyway. This, this is why you need to invite the banker. <laughs> <laughs> But then, if you sell loans or something, so there's like an obligation ready to retire and it's paid back on like a simple term. No, I take a loan out and I have an agreement 20 years later, pay back mm -hmm. with some like extra money. So if you sell it around this like stone or mortgage, however, it loses it because it loses the value over time. Now it's not always the same, like it runs out of time. I run out of time. If I'm dead, I cannot pay it back anyway, so the whole thing is useless. Mm -hmm. Doesn't also like have like a, a time attached to it, so you cannot yeah. endlessly have it. Like oh the stone is from thirty six, perfect, I like it. Um well it's useless or not at one point. They don't exist forever. I imagine. So they might disappear, however. Yeah, the, actually, the products we're talking about, they are quite short term and they're not, they have, they don't have long, so what was called maturity. You know, mm -hmm. they are you know, two or three years or something like that. And, uh, and then? And then you replace it with something else. You settle it and then you enter into a new one or you know, let's say something else is more profitable at that point and you, yeah. you, you, you that type of Are we talking around your area rather than to your area? Because I'm kind of thinking that like what we're you work within a very specialised particular area of the bank and, and your uh, and the your experience there is I would imagine very um I'll just say again specialised. Um and um, we're bringing uninformed, general kind of like <laughs> idiot populist ideas about banking. So it's like, I'm, what I'm curious about is like these are these presume these, if these are peripheral, these are not the things you're really dealing with in your yeah. day to day. What are the big problems that or the, <laughs> what are the, what are the really taxing things that you're spending your time thinking about that are probably related to these things, but not these problems about you know our concerns. About. 
that is perhaps mm. that slightly threatening or unknowable entity. Mm. Um, I suppose purely from uh, perspective of our role, which is a legal role, um, it's it's more things like regulatory compliance, you know, this massive regulation and um, you know, making sure you're, you, you're, you understand what it is you have to speak, speak with it. Um, Brexit is another one, it's a massive one. Um, you know, well, this is sort of thinking through the you know, implications and kind of Literally, on a transaction by transaction basis, we have to work out, you know, what, what is the solution here. Um, those are the, sort of the immediate problems. Uh, um, and then, yeah, I mean, it's, um, um, I wouldn't describe them as big problems, but it's kind of more regular, regular problems that you think about our sort of um, legal concerns that come up on, on particular, uh, not particular clients or um, particular structures, you know, that your desk might want to do a particular thing, like, you know, I do, I do Islamic finance and sometimes there's a very sort of fine line between um, you get an advice that is not clear in the sense that you know there is no sometimes there's no clear legal position right you can be the, the, there are different interpretations you go to different um council and they give you different views and you have to make a call on you know what you're going to do which advice are you going to take you know are you, um you know are you endangering the bank by uh being a bit sort of um um, brave and taking the less conservative approach, or that sort of stuff that we have to deal with. But lawyers are very sort of people think there are sort of this this idea that there are clear rules, or sort of somehow there is a legal answer, and a, a lot of the time there isn't, and it's very much a question of uh, interpretation and very much a question of making a judgment call. What is the correct sort of not only correct legal position, because sometimes that's very blurred and you don't know, but um, the, what is the right thing to do here from being prudent from, from legal and from legal perspective. Those are the things that occupy me. Um, but would you agree with that, Tim? You know, these are the big things. Yeah. That do you both work in the same department for the same, same department but different different uh, different products? So James does bonds. Um, I do. Don't you bond? Do shares? You do bonds. I know. A bit. <laughs> 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 but you do capital markets. Yes. You do sort of financing in the form of the securities, not securities, yeah. rather than loans. And I do. I do more sort of. Um, so what you do is is is, is sort of pub, public in the sense that you know there's um, do you also do the, the um, retail issues which is as well as most of the professional yeah or the the, the the there are obviously um, some types of issuances where re, you know uh, consumers like us can can buy bonds and subscribe for shares, but um, we rarely do those, or you know, certainly I'm not aware of Roger doing it, but um, that's the capital market side of things, and then I do that sort of more lending, uh, loan contracts, and mm -hmm. um, some businesses as well, and uh, um, yeah. It's a good, good point to stop <laughs> for today. <laughs> and uh, turn off the camera. And like, but before we do that, thank you, thank you, thank you, thank you, Tamuna, thank you, um, Francesca and Liam, everybody who came. And um, thank you for watching. Please subscribe. I need a thousand <laughs> for our future here on YouTube. <laughs> and that's it. And come back.
next time. There will be, ah, yeah, cool. There will be another, there will be another uh, lecture conversation next month in October from Berlin. Completely different with a um, DJ, musician, someone who has huge knowledge of music in relation to history. And he pins in his podcast things together, like with the music from the Antarctis, with like tribal music from Africa, with house music from Detroit, with Can you say who I knows? Like, I I no, I sent the links out later. Okay. Uh, <laughs> to to, uh, to make <laughs> <Jesus. this matter. laughs> right? it will be really good. In musicology, politics, music, you see, it will be nice. Okay, thank you. And uh, good night. Good night. <laughs> 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 <laughs>